very dirty city. city. It was that, that, I, that I actually grew up on a boat farm in Germany. In Germany. Um, um, and, and when I was when five, I was five some, some guy, guy, a scientist <laughs> in Switzerland, a British scientist, um, put online the World Wide Web. I don't think it made the headlines anymore, but it has its 25th birthday this month. And it's pretty amazing what happened in the last 25 years with it, right? Um, we can do things like live in Vancouver and work for a company in Chicago. Um, we can you know, meet in Iceland at a conference with people from all over the world. Uh, and most important of all, we can look at cute cat videos all times of the day. So that was a pretty big change. And, and, and that's kind of similar to how I feel about machine learning. Um, I like to use the much cooler sounding but less accurate term, artificial intelligence, or AI. And um, yeah, it's kind of like, a, like the internet. It's a general purpose technology. Um, we had two talks already that talked about using AI to generate art. Google is using it to drive cars. And I'm gonna talk about using it to do um, natural language processing. Uh, the cool thing about the web browser is that Google and Mozilla are actually offering us an API, maybe you've seen it yesterday, to do speech recognition, but to make sense of that language is a little harder and just like parsing HTML, not possible with regular expressions. So I have this, you probably can't see this, but there's a giant pile of wires over there. Um, it wasn't my greatest idea to bring my own audio setup, but I had some good help to get it all working, hopefully. And um, the reason is that I brought a, a friend that's on this giant screen we can talk to it. Uh, I talk to it by pressing this button. It's a little, it's called a flick. Um, you can get them in four packs too. It's actually pretty cool. You hook it up to your Android device or other Bluetooth enabled device. We were about that yesterday. Um, and uh, yeah, it's literally just a button, but you can program it to do stuff and I programmed it to get my friend to listen. So let's see if that works. Hey, can you hear us? Eh, so this already starting out bad, but that's okay. Hey, can you hear us? Oh, that's much better. Um, you might see the I don't know what you're talking about screen a little more often. I'm going to explain it a little more as well. Cool. Um, do you want to tell us your name? The name came from me watching too many movies about AI. Um, you might know Samantha from the movie Her and Samaritan from Person of Interest. Um, the UI is actually inspired by it, but besides that, this thing has nothing to do with an AI companion that outgrows us and nothing with an evil super intelligence that <laughs> tries to run the world. Um, so maybe you can tell us what you do. No? Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell us what you do? <laughs> maybe we can quickly go over what this is actually. This screen is the, I'm not sure. And uh, you see down there, you can actually teach it new actions to perform with um, the, text that it got. Uh, let's try one more time. Can you tell us what you do? Well, there we go. Third try is a charm. Um, so it's an open source intelligent, in quotation marks, because it is obviously still pretty dumb, a system that you can train and extend yourself. Um, I, you might know or use a Siri or Alexa or M, which is still in beta. There's many, many things like that that have come up in the last little while. And uh, they're all kind of still like black boxes. And this thing, you can teach your own language and also extend with plugins written in HTML5 and JavaScript, which is pretty cool. 
the whole thing actually is written in JavaScript in HTML5 and Node. And I'm going to go into the tech in a little bit. Okay. When you don't know what else to say, you just talk about weather. Hey, what's the weather like? Dramatic pause. That was my idea. But let's see. There we go. There we go. So this is actually an example for a plugin. It's using uh, plain jQuery, simple weather, um, and it's using the current location. Now you can also ask for a city. Please only a city because Yahoo doesn't allow to ask for anything else anymore. And for I think the next little bit, I might need a volunteer. But let me first show you what you're getting into. Um, I brought another mic that you can use. And we'll try if it is as stubborn for you as it is for me right now. So um, I would start with you know, introducing myself. Um, hey there, my name is David. Cool. Sometimes it says hello, Dave, which is kind of creepy. <laughs> um, this is the only evil robot joke in <laughs> this talk. I'm going to not do any other ones. Um, cool. What's the weather like in Vancouver? Dramatic pause, and it is a little warmer than here. It was really warm the last couple of days, which I was actually glad to not be. <laughs> Cool, um, and maybe the last thing uh, is you can actually look up general things like when was the moon landing, who is the president of the United States. Uh, I asked it a couple of times. Uh, when did Iceland become a country? Got to get this one right. Dramatic pause, dramatic pause. That I think is right. Um, cool, so. We can do three things. Um, if I have a volunteer that wants to try it out, uh, we can go through the process and see what happens. Um, this is, you know, this is like live coding. Of course, nothing ever goes wrong when you try to live code. <laughs> so, um, and Max is here in the front. Okay. Let's see if it works. So maybe start with your name. Um, I'm going to press the button when it dings. It's like an answering machine. You start talking to it. Uh, let's see how this goes. Hello, my name is Max. jokes than me. <laughs> All right, let's figure out uh, the weather in your hometown. Let's try if that works. What is the weather like in Portland, Oregon? Oregon, you're oh, almost, almost correct. <laughs> so um, the cool thing about this is that you, you know, if you get, like, for example, the location wrong, you can always say, hey, this is not right. I'm going to teach you a new thing, and then it'll remember it the next time. Um, that's the cool thing about AI, right? It always gets better as you work with it, and especially as you work with it for you. You don't have to learn series language or Alexis language. You can actually teach in your own language. All right, now the most, the most uh, interesting part is something that you always wanted to know. It's uh, like dates, things like who painted the Mona Lisa, um, stuff like that. Um, it might not work, but that's what we're here for. So let's give it a try. What is the answer to the life of the universe every day? <laughs> oh, let's try it again. What is the answer to life, the universe, and everything? Four trillion years. <laughs> That's what we got to <laughs> 13 degrees. <laughs> So as you see, um, this is unpredictable, like a little child, which is uh, quite entertaining. But yeah, let's try one more. I think we still have some time. 
When did humans land on the moon? Dramatic pause. Huh? That is actually correct. <laughs> Thank you, Max. All right, um, this actually turned out way more entertaining than I thought it would be. Um, now, before we look under the hood on what's happening now, let's talk for a couple minutes about the technology. Um, so, I said this is all built in Node and um, JavaScript and HTML5. Uh, the voice recognition is done on the client which, with the HTML5 speech API. And on the back end, there is uh, three libraries that don't have a logo. You see where the focus is, the front end technologies all have a logo, and some that look very similar too. Um, and on the back end, there is no natural. Uh, has anybody heard of that? It's a natural language processing library for Node. Um, it, it has like some basic things like tokenization of a sentence. It also has basic classification um, and that was cool, but the classification runs on um, statistical analysis, and I thought it would be an interesting exercise, because I've been watching too many movies about AI, to hook it up to a neural network. Uh, Amy yesterday talked about uh, Synaptic.js, that is one. The other one is Brain.js. Uh, which is being used there, and the connector between the natural language and Node is uh, I call it natural brain. So you can use that to put sentences into, train it with certain sentences, and then get label them and get probabilities back when you put something else in. So a typical, um, yeah, neural network machine learning thing. Um, now, I know th this is an, feathers is another thing I made. And I know this talk is not about feathers, but I can't just help about talking about it, because uh, I never had the chance to do that before. Um, and I think it also covers something that's, that's still kind of important and not done that often, which is uh, how do we make machine learn data available publicly, right? I mean, Siri Emma, is an app, Alexa is a box <laughs> that sits in your living room. But how do, you, how do you make it publicly available? And not just with an SDK, but actually as an a a API. So what Feathers does, it, it's kind of like a small library on top of Express that lets you create and consume REST and real-time APIs. And that's it. So you can pick whichever da database you want. You can pick whichever front-end technology you want. It's just this connector in between. And what this basically does in this case is gives us a database connection because we need to store stuff. Um, it's using NEDB because uh, the whole thing will, it's running in the browser right now, but it also can run in Electron. So um, that means that we don't want people to install MongoDB and stuff like that. It's just a file-based database. Um, and then it also provides the connection because it also works on the client between the front-end app and the back-end. And then we have um, Electron React and Steel, which is a module loader that can actually load stuff dynamically without having to build it. I needed that for the plugin system, which we'll hopefully have some time to look into. Cool. Um, so there's two, three. Oh, I, that's why my sound always changed. Um, so there's a couple of things to it. Um, the first one, and I don't even think I have to blow that up because this screen is huge, maybe a little bit. Um, the first one is actions. Uh, an action is basically something that you want it to do. Um, we see here, uh, the first one is, hi, my name is David, uh, it, that's just the action type. And then you have the tags. The tag is basically, if you have a, mat, a sentence, try and pull out something that's similar. So in our case, uh, the two tag goes from position four to four, which is zero, one, two, three, four, which is the name. So if somebody says, can you, uh, hi there, my name is, it'll usually try and pull out the information around that sentence. This is actually a pretty dumb algorithm, but um, it works so well because the classification of the neural network is so accurate that you don't have to worry about the sentences being so different. So this is how it gets, where, what's the weather in Vancouver and things like that. Uh, then we have something here, reply. 
uh, with a couple of things. And uh, this is the search. Of course, uh, this has been done by people way smarter than me already, and there's an API for it. Um, and a really cool one, actually, that I hope I have some time to show in a little bit. So this is actions. There's only 11 of them. And then the next part of the thing we have is trainings. So, you know, people always think that you need millions and millions of training data for machine learning to be useful at all. Uh, I have 115, and well, it's somewhat accurate. <laughs> um, so, this basically maps a text to an action. Every time we make a new classification, it'll save the old, when it's not sure, it'll save the old one and retrain with that one so that every time you ask it, it'll get more accurate. And the action is basically just the action that I, said, that I just showed you. Oh, sorry. It's all good. I'm going to go back here then. I thought this one, this one did work. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so uh, this sounds much better. So uh, now we have actions and trainings. The last part of the API actually is uh, the interesting one, which is the classification. And classification is basically you can just post to this classify endpoint with your actual text. So if you say, can you tell us the weather in Berlin, and I send this, it'll come back with something like this. Uh, the text, the tokens, tokens are just each individual word. Um, stems are interesting. Um, this is basically the base form of the word, so that if you have singular, plural, it doesn't matter. Or if you have other languages that add a lot of things at the end of words, um, you want to know what the actual word is about. So um, that's pretty useful. And by the way, this should ideally also work with other languages. I tried it uh, briefly with German. I unfortunately didn't have enough time. Um, but because it's all based on um, word stems and neural networks, you can train it in your own language if it is possible to, uh, if no natural has a stemmer for it. So it can build the, uh, create the base forms of a word. Cool. This is the action that it created. Basically, it creates a new action for us. And um, this is the confidence. So it's actually pretty confident already because we've done it many times. It's 96% confident that this is what I want. And this is the original action that it got trained with. Um, now, if you look back into the browser, you'll see that it's, yeah, there we go. Um, you'll see that it updated in browser already. Um, now, it still has to when did humans land on the moon in. It's pretty warm in Berlin. All right, so what happens in the background is, let's make this a little bigger too, because this is where the actual machine learning part happens. You'll see here, it gives us a list of labels to values, and those are the confidences of what action you want to perform. So we'll see here there's a whole bunch of them that are like less than one, less than, way less than 10%, but this one is 92%, and this is exactly the one that we wanted it to do. So um, that was really cool to see under the hood and how it gets better the more you train it. All right. Uh, give me back my browser. Let's briefly look at how to build a plugin because I found it really important to make it almost as easy as creating a jQuery plugin. Um, even though jQuery is not used as much anymore, it's still, uh, the creating a plugin for it was the easiest thing you could ever do. And I really like that. So. A plugin basically has a client and a server file. And on the server, in our case, for this one, I'm going to actually show you first what this plugin is about. Uh, this is the looking up information on the internet. And it's using Wolfram Alpha, which is by the people that also made Mathematica. 
And um, it's a knowledge engine. So instead of things like Google it, that looks up relevant links for you, it actually tries to get the meaning from what you ask it. So when did people land on the, the moon? It'll give us way more, whoops, way more information um, than what we got back in the answer, but um, you'll basically get the same, the same things. So this is pretty cool because I didn't have to do it. You just use the API and um, then display it on the client. So what we did here was uh, use the Node API plugin, create a new client with the app ID. Um, this is only a test API key if you want to <laughs> use it. Um, and then um, it cr we'll, we'll create a new Feather service. It's kind of like a, a middleware, except for that it has a, a cr CRUD object that you pass. And um, in this create, so if you post or call create, uh, we'll create a query with, we grab the query from the data and then just get the result from the client and return it back. Um, so this is just an API endpoint, just like the classify service that we posted to. And on the client, we have the same Feathers app, uh, but two additional things. One is learn. So when you, you saw the I don't know what you're talking about screen, you can basically add things to the dropdown and say, OK, now tell me the weather. Now do this and now do that. Uh, you can create your own forms and submit your own data um, in here. And then we have the actual action. So when the action is certain enough, so when it's more than 50% sure, it'll just perform the action. And uh, what we do here is pretty much get the text, um, make a query here to our service that we created on the server. So um, the cool thing about this is that it's client agnostic now, so we could also put it on our mobile phones or uh, mobile apps or Electron, which is what it's gonna run in as a distributable. And then we have the results and just print the main or primary primary result out. And that's, that's pretty much it. And, that, and then this is a plug-in teardown function, so you just clear it out. So you can use whatever technology you want. You get all the information that it got trained with, and then you can perform whichever actions you, you would like. So um, that was pretty fun. And, and this, once I had the whole system um, in place, was actually really quick to do. And I spent like a whole afternoon asking it random questions. All right. So uh, th this whole project started as, oh, I should I have to remember to stay here. This whole project started as a, a demo for the Calgary meetup that I helped run before I moved to Vancouver. And um, we wanted to just show, hey, here's some things that you can do with feathers. and. Um, Let's, let's try and use some AI. So we built a collaborative um, gesture teaching app, which was really cool. Um, it was clunky, but it worked. And the next step was to uh, go into natural language processing. And I couldn't find anything related to it except for the no natural library for, for JavaScript. And there is only two uh, personal assistant projects uh, similar. There's Sirius, which is um, a research project that tries to do much more, like make sense of photos and learn from everything, not just language stuff. And uh, Jasper, I think, which is a Python app that's built to run on your um, uh, Raspberry Pi or device like that. Uh, and this one, on the other hand, I'd really like to have as a desktop app and, and a, a web app. And it, it worked really well as a demo, and, and then I just continued working on it. Good time. Continue working on it. Uh, and three weeks ago, I was hacking away, and I was teaching it new things, and it recognized them, and when it didn't, then I showed it new things. And all of a sudden, when it, once it learned a little more, it was really weird, because it, it, it got less and less sure of things that it learned before. So if I said thank you, it would be like, I'm only 20% sure you want me to say you're welcome. And, and that was really weird because, you know, as a programmer, we used to pro you program it in once and it'll like just work forever. 
So I tried to figure out what the problem is, and um, I think, sorry, it's really helpful sometimes to have a uh, non-programmer sounding board, because then you have to explain it in different terms. And when I did that, I said, so I built this thing, and it works, but it's super confused with the old stuff. The new stuff it knows really well, but the old stuff it doesn't. And uh, we talked about it, and it's like, Dave, you accidentally built Marvin a paranoid Android. <laughs> and, and, and that was really interesting because the programmer, right? You always like, okay, I program it in once and it'll work and I get mad if it doesn't work. Um, even with Siri, you're like cursing Apple because they didn't get what you wanted to do. Um, and that was the case here too. The problem was no positive reinforcement. It was, I was only telling it when it was wrong what else it was supposed to do. So, that was really interesting for me to learn that um, you have to treat it less like programming and more like teaching a person or teaching someone, which was really cool for me to see because I think uh, in the near future we might be you know, teaching our software as much as we program them and l looking at where those data are stored, how they're shared and where they're coming from is gonna become more and more important uh, and just like we made better operating systems with at least making parts of it open source, I think there should be a way for training data for machine learning to be um, shareable as well. There is not even a shareable format. Neural networks work very, have a fairly similar architecture in most programming languages, and there isn't a, a, a standardized format yet to, to, um, to exchange it. So if I train it with Google's TensorFlow, I can't drop it into Brain.js to use it in the browser. And I think that's gonna be, gonna be pretty important in the future, and uh, I, I find it pretty exciting because it's, well, it's way more unpredictable, but that's how our work is every day anyway. And working with the computer the same way we work with other people, I find pretty exciting. And one thing I wanna work on a little more is turn this into a fancy generator that just sta scaffolds your app by asking you a couple of questions. It's a pretty basic step, but it will make things a lot easier because you can actually interact more instead of going through a command line. And yeah, if you're interested in this as well, come chat to me. This is it from me, and thanks everybody for being here. <laughs>